Welcome to the Open Apple Podcast, where we celebrate the Apple II. Whether you're a longtime user, a nostalgic visitor, or a newcomer to the community, join us as we share news and memories of Steve Wozniak's most famous personal computer. Broadcasting live from MP3 behind the fortified walls of the secret Open Apple Podcast bunker deep within the suburbs of metropolitan Denver, I'm Mike McGinnis, and with me as always is the Aramis to my Athos, the Rosencrantz to my Guildenstern, the Daffy to my Bugs. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he's the DJ, I'm the rapper. Please put your hands together for Mr. Please, Please, Please himself, Ken Gagney! Hello! How are you, Mike? I'm doing well, Ken. How are you? I am fantastic. I gotta tell you, it is cold and dark in this bunker. <laughs> well, turn the light on. You know, I, I think we were put here in the first place to w- keep an eye on these nuclear missiles, but that's just not a job appropriate for humans. We really should be replaced that's by machines. That's a secret. Oh, whatever. They're going to find out anyway. Turn your key, sir. We need confirmation. That's right. Anyway. Anyway. So how are you? I am well. It's February, which means that Open Apple launched a year ago this month. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. Mm. <laughs> I believed when we launched this podcast that we would last at least this long, and we have. We certainly have, yes. (laughs) I started thinking about doing a podcast years before we actually did so, and my thought was two guys would sit down for about two hours and talk about four different things that were timeless and evergreen, split it up into four half-hour episodes, and we'd have four episodes all queued up to be published in the future. And that would probably be it. And if it was well-received, maybe we'd get back together and do it again. And if not, well, then we promised from the get-go that it would only be four episodes, so people got what they expected. So I think it's so far been very well-received. Yeah, and I am really glad we didn't go with my original format. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think once a, once a week might have been a little much. Well, I don't know if it would have been once a week, but... Oh, you didn't mean maybe, like, like release one episode every week? Maybe one a month, whatever. Okay. Uh, but... It wouldn't have been timely because it just would have been, you know, like I said, timeless topics. And I much prefer the more dynamic quality of seeing what's happened in the last month, bringing somebody new on to talk to about it. You know, every episode is different. Yeah, I, I think it's turned out really well. I, I was listening to a couple of our earlier episodes a couple of weeks back, and and they were kind of, they were kind of hard to listen to. I mean, not not because of our guests or anything like that, just because of the technical problems we had, and, and I don't think that we were entirely comfortable uh, working in this medium yet. So, and hopefully, if we continue to improve, they'll they'll keep coming back. You actually listen to this show? Uh, I'm lying. You caught me. <laughs> no, I remember that we had an episode zero, which we never published. And that was just awful. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> yeah, just the first 10 seconds were like, okay, and now what? <laughs> we'll just pretend that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday we'll release no! it. No! No, you're right. Not while I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, that could be arranged. <laughs> hey! <laughs> just kidding. We are still belatedly mulling over the results of the listener survey. We do appreciate everybody who took the time to submit their thoughts, and it It's not that we're disregarding it, it's just that there's a lot to think about there, both regarding the content, the format, the presentation. And also the gist of what we got was we don't need to make any major changes, uh, which is good. Yeah, I think overall people were were satisfied with uh, the product that we've been putting out. Right, but there are a few things that we're going to be talking about. It's just hard to find time to sit down and talk about that when we're already doing Open Apple and Apple II Scans and A2 Central and Juice GS and Apple II Bits and you know 6502 lane but we did promise a prize yes you did and we and, and, and we tell me what we, i won ken <laughs> you won the opportunity to appear on open apple with me oh man what a letdown yeah that's what we call a booby prize <laughs> but we do have a fabulous prize which i'm pleased to announce is a set of microzine entertainment discs as mentioned many times here on open apple these discs are complete with boxes and manuals and include issues nine 20, 24, and 25. And one of our survey takers is going to win that. Uh, Shipping is free. I'll drop you a note telling you that you've won, and you'll send me your postal address, and I'll mail it off to you or to anywhere else in the world that you like. And of all the folks who took our survey, the winner is Brian Lutcher. Congratulations, Brian, and thank you for taking our survey. Yay, Brian. And just to provide some specific feedback about our show, Brian said, great job, by the way. I would like to see more on emulation, as this can be a great way to keep the Apple II alive for years to come. Talking about the history is nice, too, as I am sure there is much more not known about. 
Thanks to your show, I just bought my first Apple II GS. Ah, excellent. Well, if we can motivate people to get back into Apple II computing, that's always a good thing. Yeah, he says he's never owned an Apple, but he used it at school and at a friend's house. And he even started a computer club at his high school. He certainly has been around the industry long enough, and we're glad to belatedly welcome into our community. Wow. Welcome, Brian. Yeah. So I hope that the prize we're sending you is a little something to help you get started. Yep. And speaking of prizes, I hope it's not too late to ask you this, Mike, but I just forgot last month. Did you get any cool Apple II or even tech or geek-related gifts for Christmas this year or this past year? Not really Apple II stuff. I don't think too many people in my life that would buy me Christmas presents actually know what I would want in, in that area, which is fine. Uh, my sister, however, did buy me an iCade. Really? Yeah, That's amazing. Which is that, that Think Geek little arcade cabinet that you can put your iPad in and play certain video games uh, with a, a, a real joystick and buttons instead of a touchscreen. So that's been very cool, and I, I did jailbreak my, my iPad, so I, I have MAME on there. It's called iMAME for All, and, and a couple of games, which makes it, frankly, a hell of a lot cooler than the games that you can buy through the App Store from Atari. Sounds like a cool sister. Uh, yeah, yeah, she scored with that one. Every now and then your family comes through. <laughs> Shocks me every time. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Ken? What, how, did, uh, how did your retro Christmas treat you? Well, I received two gifts. I think one I may have already mentioned is from my friend Sarah, whose Apple II you and I transported from Denver to Boston this summer. Yeah, that was very cool. What, the transporting the Apple II from Denver to Boston? Well, no, because that meant road trip with you, which is never cool. But I was talking about the, <laughs> was talking about the ornament. She made me my own Apple II Christmas tree ornament. The design is original. The materials are some sort of an embroidery floss. And the attention to detail is remarkable. I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's all up on the Juice GS blog with full galleries and also a Creative Commons design that you can download in case you want to replicate your own Apple II. Neat. Yes. The only other tech gift I got is one that I specifically asked for, so it's not really much of a surprise, and it's not at all Apple II related, but it's Season 9 on DVD of the Machinima series known as Red vs. Blue, which is based on the Halo video game, which I've never actually played. Hmm. Have you ever seen Red vs. Blue? I've seen a couple of videos online, but, but I, haven't, I haven't dedicated any time to really getting into it. Yeah, it's a weekly video series that uses the assets from Halo with original dubbing over it, and they've since expanded to include original art as well. It's really remarkable. It's evolved over the last 10 years from a comedy show to a comedic action drama. The language is definitely not safe for work. So if you're someone who prefers cleaner humor, this is not for you. And after nine seasons, it might be a little bit hard to get into. But I think it's just one of the greatest things since sliced bread. But another thing I did this recent holiday season was I went to the Boston Museum of Science which I'd previously been to with Ryan Suinaga and then again later with Annie Malloy. I went to their computer exhibit, which, and I was surprised to find not only has it moved location in the museum, but they removed their Apple II. Oh, no. Yeah, really. I was headed there with a friend of mine to show her this Apple II that she'd never seen before, and there was nothing to show her. Were you able to extract an explanation from someone there? I actually did find an archived copy on their website of the webpage that talked about the Apple II, and I sent the link to the Museum of Science or, or staff, and I asked them, what's the deal, guys? What happened to this Apple II? I got an email back from Sean at Science Central saying that my email was forwarded to the appropriate department. That was two days ago. Haven't heard anything back yet. I'm sure it's not really a priority for them, but I did want to let them know that its absence was noted. Now, is this an original Apple II? I don't recall, but I do have a picture of it that I took the last time I was there, and I'll put that in the show notes. Well, I'm just wondering if they, they realized that they could get, you know, 10 or 15 grand for it on eBay. <laughs> Even without the original box? Well, it's an Apple II. It's an original, and it's rare, rare, rare. So, That's right, ultra rare. Right. <laughs> With at symbols instead of A's. That was my company to the museum, but I understand you had some company in your own house. I did, actually. Beagle Brothers programmer extraordinaire Randy Brandt stopped by my house last week. And I got to geek out with him for a couple of hours and hear some really awesome Beagle Brothers and Apple Works stories. And it was kind of, I don't know, I, I kind of turned into a giggling fanboy a little bit. I, you know, he, he wanted to see, cause I have, I have a, a, a cider hard drive that has Apple Works loaded on it. And I, you know, I forgot how to load that and show him and it was kind of embarrassing, but he seemed to have a pretty good time. So, um, 
um, it was nice to, to have uh, an Apple II legend in my house for a little while. I doubt he would have remembered how to run that hardware any better than you did. Well, that's probably true. It's so cool that you just happen to have this Apple II legend in your own backyard. Yeah, it's it's uh, it was kind of random, you know, because I know he lived in California for a while and, and ended up out here. And in fact, um, we, you and I, met up with him at uh, the Denver Apple Pie meeting this this past summer. And and none of this would have happened if you hadn't contacted him and say, "Why don't you show up at this thing?" Well, actually, it was he who contacted me. I was driving across the country with Andy Malloy. We stopped at Thomas Compter's house in western Massachusetts to pick up some old copies of the newsletter Nog for you to scan, Mike. Mm-hmm. Or it was was it Nog? Uh, Nog was the group. It's the AppleWorks forum. While I was flipping through the pages while Andy was driving, I came across an article by Randy that I thought was interesting, so I blogged about it on Apple 2Bits. The mention of his name caused it to show up on his Google Alerts. He emailed me. I said, oh, by the way, I do this magazine called Juice GS, just like you used to do the AppleWorks form. Would you be interested in reading it? Uh, let me know, and I'll send you a sample copy. He said, sure, here's my address, and I looked at it. And by that time, I was already in Denver, and I thought, this is only five miles away. So I emailed him. I said, I'm not going to mail it to you. I'm going to hand deliver it to mm-hmm. you. You have to come to this Denver Pie meeting, at which I'm presenting about the history of the Apple II. And he, and he did. And he did. Yeah. I guess the group coordinators recognized him. He used to belong, but it had been a while. And they were happy to welcome him back into the fold. Although if, if you felt foolish in front of him at your house, I felt foolish giving that presentation because I had some of my history of AppleWorks completely wrong. And, of course, who would know it better than than Randy right there in the audience? Well, at least you didn't claim that uh, there was a version of ClarisWorks for the Apple II. Yeah, some things you just have to diplomatically let slide. That's true. Yep. And let the audience member, you know, the customer is always right. That's right. Uh, but speaking of Apple II legends, I think we have a renowned member of the community here to join us on the show this month. So why don't we bring him on board? Sounds good to me. Hi, this is Steve Weirich from the Apple II History website. You're listening to the Open Apple Podcast. So one of the comments on our listener survey a couple months ago that we are heeding is that we have more focus not on software but on hardware. We're doing that tonight by bringing onto the show the talented and brilliant Mr. Michael J. Mann. Hello, Michael. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> Not sure how to respond to that kind of an intro. <laughs> I'm sorry, have I hyped you up a bit too much? <laughs> a little more than I normally would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think anybody who's familiar with your work would find that I've understated anything. Well, thank you. So, Michael, I interviewed you for a cover story in Juice GS a couple years ago, but as I said, that was a couple years ago, and I have not remembered all the details. I hope you have. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Every last one. (laughs) So tell us a little bit about your background. I do recall that you've been working with computers a lot longer than you've been working with the Apple II. Uh, Yeah, that's true. I actually got started with computers uh, back when I was a a senior in college, and I had took a numerical analysis class. (laughs) If you ever tried inverting a 5 by 5 matrix with a hand calculator, I think you'll know why I got interested in computers. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Sounds like a necessary shortcut. Yeah, they had a 1620 on campus, and I found it, and uh, found out that I could get in at all hours of the day and night. And uh, so pretty soon I was, I taught myself Fortran and then assembly language for the 1620. (laughs) And then from there on out, it was just uh, computers everywhere, just about. Now you have a background in nuclear engineering, is that right? Uh, yeah, nuclear physics. And is that how you spent your career? Uh, no. No, it's, <laughs> it's how I spent my educational career. Uh, but uh, even before I left Caltech, I found myself drifting into the computer center uh, because I was doing experimental nuclear physics. And experimental nuclear physics results in a lot of data. So, uh, again, more data than you want to crank around with a hand calculator or, or by graphing. So I started writing programs to process the data and uh, got a hold of, uh, uh, as somebody once said many years ago, that all the really interesting research on computers is done on obsolete machines. (laughs) And certainly as aficionados of the Apple II, we can appreciate that idea. Mm -hmm. Sure. In this case, it had to do with the fact that the modern machines, the 7094 and the 7040, were pretty well monopolized with people doing real work. And that meant that it was supported by government funding and all that stuff. So uh, you could run programs on them, uh, generally in association with the classes. But the only way to get access to basically unrestricted computing time, well, actually, I guess I'm talking about a personal computer. The only personal computer 
was the obsolete computer that was in the next room. Hmm. And uh, that was a Burroughs 220, which was as big as a room, the last commercial vacuum tube machine. And uh, I used that to write interactive graphics programs for reducing data from the nuclear physics experiments, hmm. which at the time was considered radical. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, now it's pretty much uh, the name of the game. And I knew it was working. I knew I should probably do more for physics by working with computers than by staying in physics. When the blackboard that was used for people to sign up for this machine started filling up with my physics compatriots who wanted to use my program to reduce their data. Hmm. That was kind of the transition for me. My, my focus really moved from physics to computers around that time. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty clear indicator that you were doing something right. Well, it certainly worked for me. I enjoyed it a great deal, and people found what I was doing useful, so mm -hmm. can't hardly beat that. You're speaking in the past tense. Is this something that you're retired from now? Oh, well, uh, yes, I'm, re I'm no longer gainfully employed. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I spent, uh, I, I left Caltech without, without getting my PhD and uh, went to Burroughs. I uh, worked for Burroughs for 13 years on, on their, uh, their computing systems and then moved out to Hewlett-Packard, where I worked for 19 years uh, on their server line. That was, uh, that was extremely interesting. Got to learn a lot of computer architecture, manage a computer language lab, Unix lab, all kinds of stuff. It was a lot of fun. And, and it also kind of reinforced the idea that the cutting edge in advancing the whole business of data processing was in the engineering of these new machines and the software that supported them. I don't mean to belittle the capabilities of the Apple II, but the level of work that you were doing doesn't sound like something that would necessarily cross paths with the Apple II. So what was your introduction to that platform? <laughs> my, inter my introduction to the uh, 0.001 gigahertz machine? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I've never heard it put that way. Yeah. Well, uh, that actually happened uh, when I was working for Burroughs uh, in 1980. Uh, I had been reading Byte Magazine and Creative Computing and all that stuff, kind of, kind of shopping, shopping silently, lurking, you know, watching the uh, scene go by and looking at what would be the best thing to do because uh, I'd actually borrowed somebody's Kim 1 uh, for about three months and played with it and got myself kind of hooked on this idea of a computer that you could have in your own home. So uh, at the end of 1980, I went out and got myself an Apple II Plus. And uh, really, I've never never looked back since then. That was the most amazing machine I've ever encountered, still to this day, just because of its uh, how it's so easy to relate to. You can just sit down at the keyboard and dun 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 dun. You know, so fantastic. And what were you doing with that Apple II? Ah, oh, gee, what did I? I'm thinking back to what I first did with it. Hmm. I think my first thing was to. Uh, to write a basic program to animate a little rocket ship that bounced off the sides of the screen, you know, was could be thrust, uh, thrust with by pushing a button on a paddle and rotated with the paddle, and uh, that was very educational, and it was impressive that it could be done in a couple three pages of basic, and, and it ran at a reasonable speed. You could actually play with the little rocket ship. Uh, then I started playing around with the sound and found ways to digitize things I played back from a cassette recorder through the cassette input port and play them back through the speaker. And if you ever tried that, you know how that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Not great, no. When I, when I was a radio amateur back in, uh, in high school, uh, single sideband and, uh, and heavy clipping were the order of the day. So <clears throat> as a radio amateur, you learn to, uh, to understand and listen to this stuff that's infinitely clipped. You know, that and stuff. And it turned out that listening to stuff coming through the speaker of the Apple II was much the same. So that was an interesting introduction. That was when I, I built the first application that I've actually made available online, which is my, my dump reader. <laughs> <laughs> you remember when you had those listings in magazines? I remember Nibble particularly would have like three pages of hex listing. Mm -hmm. And all you had to do was type it in. <laughs> oh, that's all. Uh -huh. <laughs> No, that wasn't quite all you had to do. After you typed it in, it didn't work, of course. So you had to figure out what on earth you'd done while you were typing it in. And the only way to do that between a printed listing and the listing on the screen of the app, too, is to look back and forth, going through every line and making yourself absolutely nuts in about two minutes. Mm -hmm. Or 
you can have, in my case, my wife help me by reading the listing back as I was looking at what was on the screen. And that worked also for about two minutes when she got nuts with it. <laughs> so that was when I wrote the dump reader. Uh, the dump reader would actually read back the what was in the Apple's memory while I was reading through the listing to make sure I got it right. And that was all done with a cassette port and, uh, and a little basic program. And it's out there on my website. Now, your, cool. your fascination with the Apple II sound capabilities has been something that seems to have been um, consistent throughout your uh, career with the Apple II, most notably and most recently with your collaborations with 8-Bit Weapon. That's true. That's true. It's kind of interesting that it's always been right there in the foreground. Now, how is it that you came to collaborate with Seth Sternberger and his wife, Michelle? I had already introduced uh, RT Synth, the real-time synthesizer, and uh, it was actually designed like I would design it for me. In other words, you could start the program up and you could fiddle with it and put, answer a couple menu questions and then play the, play the keyboard. And Seth contacted me, this must have been about, what, three, maybe almost four years ago, and said uh, that he had tried it out and it was a very nice, very nice sounds. He could, he felt like he could use it, but it was also um, a little noisy when, if you're like in a concert venue and you booted the thing up, it would, there were beeps and boops and uh, things to play with, with the monitor and stuff to answer questions before you got to the place where you could actually use it. And he said, well, if you could make a concert performance version of this, where you just stick the disc in, turn the computer on, and it all comes up and goes, tweak, and it's ready to roll, that would be very handy, and I'd be happy to market that on my website. I thought, well, that doesn't sound too hard, and it wasn't. It turned out that uh, by the time all we had to do then was build a splash screen, and uh, basically it was a slightly rebadged RT synth, and uh, he, uh, he sold a bunch of copies of it. And, and apparently, the bit, the chiptunes scene really enjoys uh, the, the, the 8-bit sound, and they're always looking for more versatility and things that sound a little different from typical 8-bit stuff, and RT synth certainly did. It's a wavetable synthesizer, which is pretty unusual in the 8-bit world. Have you gotten feedback from bands who have used your software and performances? Uh, not directly, except from Seth. Mm -hmm. uh, Seth has told has has sent me several things he's done and told me how how useful it has been. But uh, recently, another performer uh, put a put up a nice YouTube video of him using RT synth or actually DMS synthesizer uh, in uh, in a performance that was really quite amazing. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Is that the one by State Shirt? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I did see that. And that's a very impressive demonstration of the software. Yeah, I really liked it. In fact, uh, one of the things I'm very proud of about uh, when, when I did RT Synth in the first place was the way I used the keyboard of the 2E. Uh, the 2E and 2C were the first machines to introduce the idea of an any key down. And the way they implemented the any key down uh, state in the you know, so, you know, soft, uh, I don't know what to call it, a port actually, in the machine, is that when you read the any key down location, you actually get the current uh, key that's down and whether or not it's pressed. And if you push down one key and then push down another key, the the key any key down value changes to the new key. So you can actually read keys even though you've got your fingers sitting on other keys on the keyboard. Hmm. And that allows you to do things like uh, like connected stuff. You know, like uh, what are they? I forget what the the musical term uh, when. You play something and you essentially put several keys down in order and you get the notes in order uh, and you don't have to lift the other ones up. So there's, there's no, no pause between notes. I was proud of doing that because it was pretty tricky to figure out how to make it work. And when I saw this video, I saw he was doing that all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's very cool. Now that was your first DMS software, Michael, but since then you've also done Drummer as well, right? That was something that about... Uh, Two, about two, two and a half years ago, shortly after getting the DMS synthesizer out, Seth came back to me and said, hey, you know, it'd really be nice to have something like this that was like a percussion sequencer. And <laughs> any of you, uh, Mike, I know you understand this. Uh, when you're, when you do a lot of programming, uh, and you've got something, you've, you've sort of built X, and then somebody says, gee, it would really be great if X did Y. 
And, and the answer when I looked at it was, oh my God, that's something entirely <laughs> different. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, it can lever, leverage some stuff. So sure. I, uh, I thought about it a little bit and then kind of forgot about it until, uh, I guess actually until about a, uh, a year ago or so when Seth said, Whatever happened to the idea, the, the idea about putting together a percussion sequencer? But, oh, son of a gun. Uh, I actually dropped the ball on that. So I got to thinking about it again, pulled out some of my notes, uh, and started working on it and, and wound up developing the synthesizer entirely in assembly language, which is something I'd never done before, doing all the I.O. and, and uh, all the editing stuff with the cursor keys and everything in assembly language. Always used BASIC to do the input and output. But it uh, worked out pretty well. And I thought, I thought naively, that it would be used for doing sort of ordinary kinds of rhythm lines. You know, nothing, nothing magical. Something, something maybe a little more like this. That's what I thought, you know, that's what I was thinking of percussion. I didn't realize that Seth was talking about stuff where there was something going on every 16th note. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I wound up writing the thing, being very careful to handle long rests between notes properly and get everything. And then I found out that there are practically no rests when it's being used in the chiptune scene. Hmm. Uh, but it certainly works fine and uh, cranks out. Cranks up pretty good audio. Michael, have you heard of the documentary 8-Bit Generation? No, I haven't. Tell me more. I don't know too much except that it is a documentary dedicated entirely to the modern-day chiptune scene, and it includes the work of the Apple II, because from the trailer I saw, there's an interview with Steve Wozniak on this film. Oh, fantastic. That's really cool. Well, in fact, if <laughs> if I thought he'd care about it, I would uh, I'd send copies of these programs to Steve. Because they make sounds that nobody ever expected to come out of an Apple II. Well, since he was interviewed for 8-Bit Generation, it seems that he does have some awareness of the chiptune scene. That's cool. So who knows? Your software could be playing on his computer right now. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> now, the, your other claim to fame is, whereas the software synthesizer seems to be more software-oriented, you've also done some fascinating work with hardware, specifically the Apple Crate. Uh, yes, that's true. That that grew out of uh, how can I describe this? Uh, I'd always, in, while I was working with the servers, I always had the Apple at home as something that I really enjoyed and liked to write code for. I very much enjoy the idea of working on a machine where you don't have infinite amounts, infinite amounts of everything, uh, where you're really constrained by the amount of memory, by the speed, by the the instruction set. And the Apple II, of course, fills that bill beautifully. Uh, but server machines were getting huge, and they were also turning into things that uh, uh, were clusters, basically. Um, so people were putting like 16 workstations in a, in a rack, networking them together, and then using software to make them perform together on solving a big problem. And I thought, now that's a good idea. I thought I could do that with Apple IIs. And in fact, if I did, I'd wind up with something that's a lot smaller. I could have like 12 Apple IIs running without having an entire, uh, you know, all the real estate occupied by 12 Apple IIs. That was the genesis of the idea. That would have been around 1992, I think. And uh, so I started playing around. If I'm going to do that, I have to find out some way to network them together. And I uh, couldn't plug any cards into them because then I couldn't put the, put the boards close together. So it all had to be done with the motherboard, nothing nothing else. And uh, that led eventually to Nodanet. And and then after Nodanet was working, uh, then I started thinking about how I could put a bunch of, bunch of these boards together. So that, that all moved along in a pretty straightforward way. Uh, I basically did the first one the simplest way I could using nothing but uh, pieces of wood with saw cuts in them to hold the boards. And of course, the hard part is wiring up all the power supply stuff. Uh, that uh, That's that's always a little messy. Uh, then later on, after after building that and then using it for a bit, I realized that I had built something that was infinitely shaky. <laughs> it, uh. it sits there, and, and if, I, if I hold on to it and shake it a little bit, the whole thing rattles, right? All the boards are kind of loose in their slots. So I thought, well, this is not a transportable machine. 
this is a this is a demo machine. So uh, that got to me got me thinking about what I could do to make something that I could exact actually bring to KFest. Mm -hmm. That's how the Apple Crate Two came to be, and in the process, of course, I made it a little bigger. Have you heard any reports of other people doing projects with not a net? Uh, well, every once in a while, uh, somebody gets interested and asks me a question about it, uh, but the conversation is not sustained, and so I think the answer must be no. Now, I remember a couple of years ago at Kansas Fest, you had a demonstration with, with two Apple two C's where you had a ball bouncing between them. Exactly. Was that done through not a net? Yes, it was. That was very neat. I, I was really impressed by that. Well, then in that case, you, you'd be interested to know that the part in there that's not a net specific is about three lines. Really? Yeah, it is. It is absolutely nothing but a little pong game uh, with uh, with a kind of uh, a kind of invisible barrier in the middle. And when it hits wow. that barrier, it sends a message to the other machine, and that tells where the ball is and which direction it's going and how fast. So that's pretty cool. That, yeah, it, it really was quite easy. And and I have to I have to thank the folks at KFest for inspiring me to do that because after I talked about Nautinet, people said, well, you know, this is awfully abstract. Uh, there must be something you can do to kind of show <laughs> what's happening. So I thought, well, son of a gun, I think there is. Well, that was certainly an effective demonstration. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's there's yeah. a, it's actually out there on YouTube, and uh, I get I, I had a couple of responses to that at first, although. There were mostly, most of it is on the YouTube forum, which is a very interesting mixed bag. <laughs> uh, and, and I guess it basically came down, the primary reaction was, uh, why? Uh, what? Uh, huh? So, <laughs> but they didn't, I guess they didn't realize that it was a demonstration in concept of these two machines communicating at relatively high speed, that is relative to human beings, and, and doing so with essentially like I say, three lines invoking that in it. So there's not much coding involved. Now, that was at Kansas Fest 2007. Was that your first K-Fest? Yes, it was. But you've been back since then, right? Uh, yeah, I have. I was back in, uh, was it 2009? That sounds about right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had things going on in the summer for a couple of years, so it's always kind of tricky to figure out whether it's going to work or not. What's your prediction for 2012? To tell you the truth, I have, at this point, I have two grandchildren on the way in May and June. Congratulations. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much. So we will not be <laughs> seeing you in July. <laughs> yeah, but by the way, I don't deserve any credit except for some sort of primordial credit. <laughs> but I'm not doing any of the work. But I do believe in parallel processing. <laughs> Get what's new and exciting in retro computing with two news. So the first news item this month is from Ivan Drucker, who has released the product that he demonstrated at Kansas Fest 2011. That is A2 Server, which is, according to his website, a method to use your Mac, Windows, Linux, or Solaris machine as a file server and network boot server for an Apple II client, which if I understand that correctly, is absolutely astounding. I remember when he demonstrated at Kansas Fest, everybody was quite impressed. Yeah, I think that's a really neat project. And uh, I, with the CFA 3000, it, it, I, if I, have, I have to admit I don't find myself needing it very much, but I think that the idea of being able to just plug a machine into another machine and get going is great. Yeah, it's kind of mind-boggling that this sort of functionality hasn't already existed. And it probably did decades ago in older versions of Mac OS and the like, but as they continue to upgrade the operating system, they phase out old functionality like access to ProDOS or write access to HFS disks, and this functionality must have been lost along the way. And here is Ivan restoring it to us, which is great. It certainly is. And Mike, you saw that presentation at KFest, right? No, I slept through that one, actually. Oh. Yeah, I, I missed that one. What, you weren't sick back then, too, were you? <laughs> no, just today. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I slept through that one, but I may have been distracted because I seem to recall last KFS being a bit busier for me than usual, being on the committee and all. I'm definitely interested in downloading this because it's cross-platform. Like I said, it's Mac, Windows, Linux. You know, chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you have one of those. But Mike brought up a good point. If you have a CFFA or some other easy way to transfer files between computers, 
What sort of need or niche do you feel that this program fills? Well, I think for somebody who's starting out who doesn't have any drives and doesn't have doesn't have a, a CFFA, it, it's, it could be a terrific thing. Um, it actually, I, I really am waiting for Ivan's uh, follow-on project, which would put the whole thing onto a little NAS uh, that I could set on the side of the desk. And what use would you have for that? Well, I think that that would be a very easy way of of setting up machines just to bring the machine over onto the desk and plug it in and be ready to roll. Uh, the snag, of course, is getting the networking onto the other machine. I assume that there is some hardware involved in this connection. Is it just a serial cable? Well, I think I think what, what Ivan recommends is an Ethernet card. Uh, so I don't I don't think it works with a serial cable. And you've got to somehow to get to Apple Talk protocols. That's too bad because the Ethernet card is sold out as of May 18th of 2011, and I'm it's been ages since I've seen the Lance GS available. So if people do need an Ethernet card, they might be uh, SOL for the time being. Yeah, that's certainly possible. There is one function here that looks really interesting to me, and that's that you can use this as a as an actual file server for your Apple II, with the um, with the your PC your your or your Mac serving the files to your your Apple II. So if you don't have a hard drive and you don't have one of these cards, you can still have a form of mass storage uh, available to you. Actually, interestingly, you can do that with not a net and another Apple II. Cool. Is that functionality a program that we can download right from your website, Michael, or is it does it take a little bit of uh, custom finagling? Uh, no, no custom finagling. Uh, it's actually a file server application that runs on a on a machine that has some mass storage, and that makes the mass storage available to all the other machines on the not a net. So, do you think it would be possible to adapt? A2 server, the program, to use not in it? I, I don't think I know enough about how it's implemented to be able to answer that. But if it's but since it primarily talks between the Apple and something that's not an Apple, then my inclination is to say no. Ah, I see. I hadn't thought of that. Relatedly, another program that connects your computers, ADT Pro, got updated to version 1.2 in the past month. Looks like it is primarily a bug fix release, uh, including a couple of issues that it had with the Apple 3 and the Ethernet now, I always thought that bug fixes, as opposed to releases that came out with new features, were like a number dot number dot x release, where the x is the increment. But this went to version 1.2. So, but shouldn't it be like version 1.1.9 or something? Actually, I think it's 1.1.a. He ran out of decimal digits. He, went, he already had 1.1.9, so this is a kind of an exception to the rule. He actually carried it over to the 1.2. Couldn't you do 1.1.10? 1. 1. Uh, well, I suppose. <laughs> but then you might have done 0. 0.9. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, I guess tricky when you're dealing with how numbers are sorted. Uh, because 9 could be 90, for example. That's right. And then you get into the deal of 1.1.9.1. 1. 1. And nobody. then you're in IP zone. Well, if Dave's anything like me, he anticipated these numbers all being single digits. And so so there's a problem unless you want to go hex. <laughs> but Dave is a perfectionist, and he's somebody that we need to get to Kansas Fest. I can't believe he hasn't come yet. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the work with ADD Pro, we've mentioned it several times on this show, as one of the best ways to get a new-to-you Apple II up and running because it just zaps everything over from another machine. And you're done. You don't even need a floppy drive. Yeah, it's great. It's actually there's something there's something else that is kind of competing in a way. I mean, it doesn't compete in functionality, but except in that critical way of getting things over and getting things going, which is um, the Apple II uh, was online game server or whatever it, what it's called. Oh I've yeah, forgotten. Egan Ford's project, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that that allows you to record these files on your on your iPod and uh, play them in the cassette input, and there you go. I recently saw a video on YouTube. It was iTunes for the Apple II. It went the other way, where you connect your cassette player to your Apple II and play songs into the cassette recorder while it's recording. So instead of updating your iPod, you're re you're updating your tape. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, definitely meant more as a parody of the functionality of the Apple II than anything. But the video was really well done. I thought it. The whoever was behind it must have had some love for what he was doing. Well, Egan did something quite amazing. Uh, instead of being strapped to the data rate of the native cassette port, he actually has used uh, higher frequencies 
and is able to move data about six times, seven times faster. Uh, so it actually is uh, goes from being something that's quite uh, tries your patience to something that's actually quite reasonable, like 15 or 20 seconds to get DOS over. Yeah, that's significant. And without an Ethernet card, too. That's exactly right. With nothing. Nothing mm -hmm. except power. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, as a, that was one of my criteria for, for not a net, is that it not require anything uh, special. And, of course, that, that was uh, compromised a little bit when the Apple IIe came out because of the way they changed the paddle inputs. Uh, but, nonetheless, there, it, it has practically nothing, essentially no hardware. And, and he's, uh, that's certainly the, the same spirit that is operating in, in trying to get machines running through the cassette port. Well, doesn't not a net require some sort of a not a net connector? Yeah, it does. There's an adapter, which is really nothing more than a couple transistors, a couple emitter followers. But that's, as I say, that was required because they really lowered the impedance of the paddle inputs, uh, with the Apple IIe. So it used to be that, like, if you were talking about Apple II Plus, an Apple II Plus could talk to a half a dozen machines with nothing but a piece of wire. Uh, but the Apple IIe, not so much. Uh, you really have to provide a little additional drive. And are those adapters sold on your website, or do you provide the schematics for them? Uh, both. Uh, there's actually not only a schematic, but a kind of a, a pictorial step-by-step -step of how to build one yourself out of a handful of parts. And uh, and I also sell them as kits or as assembled adapters for, let's see, what are the prices? I think it's like $5 or $10 each, something like that. So it sounds like you're somebody who believes in the open source movement. Oh, absolutely. And yet you sell the DMS drummer software. Uh, well, that was done. I, I probably wouldn't have developed that left to myself. That's something that Seth specifically inspired. And so he had. I gave him first rights on setting the price and all that stuff. And uh, whereas RT Synth, which is DMS synthesizer under another name, is available free on the website, that was already there before DMS synthesizer was released. But in the case of DMS drummer, I, I let Seth call the tune. I apologize if it seemed like I was trying to back you into a corner. I think artists of your talent deserve to be acknowledged and paid for their work. I was just, it was interesting to see the two different kinds of projects coming from one person. Yeah, I understand. It's um, it, this is actually the first time I've ever involved and been involved in any way with software of mine being sold. I first the first things I did, I guess, sound editor was the first thing I sort of put out there in ninety two or three, whatever it was, and uh, and I was thinking then about putting out a shareware, and I I was uh, talking to my wife about it and I said, well, you know, I this maybe asked for five dollars or something like that, and she said, well, why are you doing this? I said, uh, I said, well, what do you mean? He says, are you doing this to make money? I said, no. <laughs> well, then why charge money? <laughs> that's absolutely correct. So that's that's my default position. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, it's a, uh, it's certainly a, uh, in this particular case because of my collaboration with Seth and his pushing me to do the project in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like he uh, he certainly deserved to have an exclusive marketplace for it. Well, it seems reasonable because it's likely that the folks who are using this software are charging admission to their performances. That's true. Yeah, so it's definitely uh, going into a commercial environment. Well, and of course, the uh, the demo version is readily available free and uh, and certainly allows a lot of playing around. So people can get the full impact of what can be done from the demo version. In fact, I've been thinking about putting out the uh, putting out a paper on the, my website discussing the theory of it and how it actually works. And if I do that, I'll publish the source code along with it. So if somebody wanted to, to reassemble it with different uh, uh, assembly parameters, they'd have the full version anyway. That wouldn't be the source code to what Seth is selling, is it? Yes, it would be. And he'd be cool with that? Well, I think so. I haven't asked him, actually. <laughs> but, I, but his market is not likely to recompile the source. So I suppose that's true. And there's, sure. no cop there's no copy protection on the disk, so... Uh, it'd be a lot easier if somebody wants to bootleg it just to make copies. Also true. Uh, the good old days of the Apple II. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, speaking of copying software, Brutal Deluxe just came out with a program to make it even easier. Antoine announced that Fishhead has been released. This is a tool to back up your files in a smart and convenient way, he says. It offers attributes preservation, batch mode, error handling, and a history log. And this is a, an Apple II GS 
program that works on ROM 1, ROM 3, and supports AppleShare, LocalTalk, and NetaTalk under System 601. Very cool. I know Tony's been waiting for this for some time. Any idea why? Well, he has a whole bunch of disks that he wants to copy over an archive at the final level. And uh, so this this is a godsend for him. And, and he particularly wanted those logs. <laughs> Since that actually is a record of what's really been captured. So this is a far more detailed program than, say, Photonics, which is a copier program that FTA came out with some time ago? Yeah, I think Photonics just copies a disk. So what does Fishhead do? I believe this is going to copy files, file by file. Oh, I see. So it's, I gotcha. So it's not creating a disk image, it's not copying the blocks and any errors on it or anything. Uh, no, it shouldn't be, although actually the question I just saw recently on CSA2 that the question of error handling came up. Like, uh, what, what do you do in case of a bad block? Mm -hmm. uh, I, one of the things I know that Antoine had as one of his objectives when we started was that it go right through errors, that it, that it continue despite encountering errors. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does bring up the question of what happens with the blocks that can't be read. And my guess is they get blank filled or zero filled or something depending on the file type. Yeah, because do you necessarily want to be copying a corrupted file? Well, you do if you'd like to get the 95% of it that isn't corrupted. A lot of copiers uh, stop on the first error, which makes them almost useless, uh, because it did, any old disk with an error then becomes uncopyable for all practical purposes, mm -hmm. even though almost all the files on it are okay. So you can you can go and find keep track you know with a log or by sitting there with a pencil marking down the files that seem to have the errors and then try to construct a list of files to copy that doesn't include those files but this is very onerous uh, much better to just blow right through it and then log the files that had problems. I've had instances where I was trying to copy like you know a, a directory of a hundred files and it would start the process and somewhere along the line it would just hang and so I had to go back and instead of copying the 100 files, copy the 50 and see if the bad file was in that one. And, <laughs> right. if that, and if it still crashed, try 25. And it was just such a pain. Exactly. And by the way, that's the worst case. Not only do you have to, uh, to retry, but you don't even know which file had the problem with, so you have to do binary search. Exactly. I'd rather just it grab the whole thing right. and, and let me figure it out later if I need to. Exactly. Hmm. And that's what Fishhead does. Kind of a nice homage to the... <laughs> Uh, to the early copy A, or, or not copy A, but um, what was it called? <laughs> copy 2 the, Plus? No, the file utility that was distributed on the system master. FID? FID, yes. FID was actually a, a, a name that originally was Fishhead. I'm not familiar with FID. What is that? Where does that name come from? It's on the DOS 3.3 system master, isn't it? Exactly. And so is it like file identifier disk or FID? Yeah, they probably made something up, but the truth is it came from Fishhead. The only thing I could think of when I heard that name was the NDA that Ryan Suinaga released that checked to see if Abe Vigoda was still alive. <laughs> but, nice. But it seems, that, it seems that there's no correlation here. <laughs> Other than a recent surge in popularity of you know, oceanic utility names. Yes, that's true. And, and as I say, a nice homage to the early history of the Apple II. Right. You know, one that might fly over some younger users' heads. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> According to, to Steve Weirich's uh, Apple II History site, the uh, the name FID stood for File Developer, F-I from File and D for Developer. There you ah, go. Thank you. But Rich Williams said the original name of the program was Fishhead, which stood for File, Shower, Helper, and Duplicator. Or, I'm sorry, File, Shower, Helper, and Duplicator. <laughs> Like it. Wow. Shower, shower, you know. And so it sounds like that was made up, too. <laughs> yeah. And then later on, they said uh, Apple Marketing said he couldn't name a program Fishhead, so he changed it to FID, which they said was okay. Uh, it really stood for Fishhead in Disguise or Fishhead in Drag. There you go. Oh, my. So sort of a recursive <laughs> out. It's, it's uh, two layers of acronyms in there. Yes. Oh, I will call it Fishhead. <laughs> Well, that's looking back. For those who want to look forward and stay current, you can use SNAP, which is you and WENUP's updated NNTP client for reading the Usenet news groups. Let's see. I need to figure out what the heck is new about it. 
Yeah, he didn't say in his posting. It, he said the the changes were outlined in the in the manual, so you'd have to download it and read the manual. And then do a diff on it. Yep. <laughs> well, hopefully there's going to be a section labeled like changes or something. <laughs> Let's see. I, I got the, okay. I just downloaded it. Wow. There's an advertisement on the first page. Hmm. Amazing. I. It's it's just it, well, it's interesting for two reasons. One is because I didn't know that people were still paying to advertise to the Apple II community. And second, I work in the magazine industry, and what I've learned is that the cover is not for sale. But here's hmm. an ad on the first page. What's it advertising? Giga News. Oh, the, the, yeah, they use oh, that. That makes sense. At least it has some relevance. So I wonder if this is Ewan's way of saying this is what I feel is the best way to get your news is through the world's best Usenet. Or if Giga News is even aware that this ad is here. Good question. I'll have to ask him about that. So let's see. So I'm looking at the table of contents in the manual. And I see sections labeled what is Snap, requirements, keyboard shortcuts, caution, uh, advanced features, extras. I don't see a section labeled like change log. No. It looks like he updated it again, actually, just a day or two ago to 1.1.1, but I didn't didn't see an announcement on that. Uh, if you look in the list of his files there, it's it's labeled as 1.1.1, and the date is uh, January well, January 12th. No, I think that's January 31st of 2012. Oh, sorry. Yep. And it looks like Snap 1.1 to me. Oh, but then the description says... Right, the manual, I think, is still 1.1, but I don't know. Huh. Well, we need to get on the horn to this guy and figure out what the hell's going on. You know, what that shows is how difficult it is to keep things synchronized when they're done separately. Okay, I found a little paragraph here that says, Update release version 1.1. Uh, and the last sentence of that paragraph says, Please read this manual fully to see what has changed and what has been enhanced. So I don't know that he's going to tell us. <laughs> well, maybe we should have done our homework before coming on the air. <laughs> Perhaps, yes. At least this isn't live. <laughs> Still time to run diff. Right. But it does seem to have a multitude of bug fixes and many enhanced features. I don't know about new features, just enhanced. So, Ewan, you have a marketing issue. <laughs> <laughs> I know just the guy to fix that for you. Let's see. Moving on, we have another program that's been updated, and that would be Virtual 2, the renowned emulator. Mike, you want to talk about that? Virtual 2 is uh, Gerard Putter's... Uh, 8-bit Apple II emulator for Mac OS, and he recently updated it. Uh, it looks like the biggest change was that he's dropped support for versions of Mac OS 10 before 10.5 and PowerPC Max. That doesn't exactly sound like an update to me. No, but it does uh, make it easier for him to support. Uh, it, this is a fairly expensive program, so uh, I, I would imagine that people who buy it probably want to be able to get top-level support from him. Yeah, it looks like there were a few changes. He, according to the change log, which is very prominently displayed on his homepage, uh, he improved the quality of the quick look preview and the thumbnail of saved state files, fixed a number of minor issues, uh, improved the copy as text command, and it looks like he's issued another update since then. Version 6.4.1 is the latest, where double-clicking a disk in the finder didn't work anymore, and now it does. And all pictures in the inspector help were missing, which has also been fixed. Hmm. Do either of you use Virtual 2? No, I haven't. I do, yeah. it's. Uh, I'm not a big emulator user overall, but it's, it's a very complete solution. So, Mike, under what conditions do you find yourself using Virtual 2 as opposed to, say, a different emulator? Uh, largely for things like taking screenshots. So I, I, get a clearer, I get a clearer picture for a web post or something like that. And Michael, uh, remind me, are you primarily a Mac or a Windows user? Uh, primarily a Windows user. Okay. So you're probably not using Virtual too much. <laughs> not at all. In fact, <laughs> uh, the emulator I use is Apple II Oasis. I use that. Uh, oh, I remember that. Yeah, that was one, by the way, that includes a file server. Yep. So you can actually use your PC as a file server to your Apple II if you want to play that game. Now, Mike, you said that you remember that. You make it sound like this is an older program. Has it not been used or updated lately? I think it's been a long time since that's been, been updated. I think it was at 2.4 or something like that. Hmm. It was the most recent version. 
I don't know if he's running the version numbers, but he updated it uh, about less than two years ago. Oh, well, I guess I'm wrong. Yeah, he made a made some changes to make things work a little better with uh, with Vista and Windows 7. Usually, the updates at this point have to do with compatibility with a moving target. Yeah, I, I had bought a license for this way back when, and really hadn't paid much attention to it since then. So I'm on what appears to be the Apple II Oasis website, and he has a navbar link labeled upgrade history i'm looking at it it says the last version 2.5 came out 10 years ago last month oh well in that case there must be some minor updates that occurred that were never in the change log <laughs> which happens huh. right but yeah, I, I think this had to do with uh, changing some of the compatibility attributes of the program uh, so that when you opened up a window uh, running it it would do the right thing yeah, if you click the download link, it actually gives you version 2.6. And the upgrade history, the, the last version listed there was 2.5. So again, read the manual. Yes. <laughs> and again, a problem with synchronizing things. It's very difficult to remember when you update something. You have to update all the things that describe it. And then you have to update all the things that refer to the things that describe it. And then you, uh, uh, after a while, it's, <laughs> after a while, it's like figure it out for yourselves. Yeah, I, it's been a long time since I've written a program intended for release, and uh, I never use anything like a, a subversion or other change log program. Uh, I've never had to check aspects out and check them in and document what changes were made. I sometimes participate in beta testing, including uh, even as early as just a few hours ago for a WordPress plugin, and it's just it's boggling how well documented this is. And I'm sure it's extremely helpful when you're dealing with multiple environments and rolling back changes, as opposed to me who just does things live on the production server. Well, the, the thing I've noticed is that my, I noticed my documentation is primarily for me. And so I document uh, my change history in the source. Uh, and even then I frequently find myself making a change and, or a set of related changes. And then, assembling and checking it out, and then realizing that the listing I just saved doesn't include the updated change log. I have to go back and change, put it in the change log and then reassemble to get a good listing. Yeah, I, I don't envy you. Well, that's, you know, that's just a uh, housekeeping thing. But, of course, after a while, housekeeping gets to be most of what you're doing. Right. You know, especially with large-scale programs. Maybe, I, I don't know how large an Apple II program is nowadays, but... You know, if you're dealing with tens of thousands of lines of code and you want to be able to collaborate on this project as part of a team, the amount of documentation that must go into it must be daunting. It is huge. And by the way, it can be different by an order of magnitude depending on how well modularized it is. If you start off by defining good interfaces, then that means you have to do a lot less communication around those interfaces. If you leave the interfaces a little loosey-goosey or you, you always you know, change them like point one, point two, point three. then there's constant communication, constant desynchronization. There's always the 5% who never gets the word. And so yeah, it's a, it's a serious problem. If the team, by the way, has one mind, if they actually are a team, you know, that, that really communicates about everything, this is much less of a problem. Or if it's a, per, a, per, a project made by one person, then they can kind of keep it all in their head. But as soon as it gets to be too big to keep in your head, or in one head, <laughs> that, that, and you become dependent on external documentation, things go to go to heck in a hurry. Yeah, the longest program I ever wrote was in AppleSoft Basic. I don't remember how many lines it was, maybe between 500 and 1,000. I go back and I look at the source code today, and none of it makes any sense. There you because go. Because I, I didn't document a single darn thing, and the variable names are completely at random. You know, there's, <laughs> well, well, one of the reasons that in basic, variables are only acknowledged by the first two characters. And you can make the names longer than that, but it's only the first two characters that basic acknowledges. Right. And I didn't take advantage of the opportunity to name them longer. So all my variable names are two characters. You know, here I'm using XY, over there I'm using YX. Oh, that's tricky. <laughs> yeah, that's when you wish you had a, a nice remark section scattered around to tell you what's going on. I was doing some inline remarks using the rem command in basic, but since that's not a compiled language, rem statements use up memory. Yes. And so I released the first version of this, and some folks saw that the rem remarks were in there, and 
they weren't really doing it too much that was useful, even in terms of documentation. So I removed them for the next version so that it would be a trimmer program and you know, better for the end user, but not so much for the developer. Yeah, there is a solution to that, which involves more housekeeping, and that's to keep the whole program as a word processing file, including all the rem statements and everything else you want, and and then uh, the, then copy that and get that into AppleSoft and optimize out all the remarks. And you can even optimize out the variable names, right? You can even throw away all of the first two characters. True. Uh, I used to. My, I've never done that. I've, I mean, I know you can do that, but I've never. It's such such a trouble to do that. I don't do it. But I do notice that inside an inner loop, I will never use more than a two-character name, and and then outside where I have state variables that are not used as often, uh, I will use a longer name that's more descriptive because it hits the time. You know, when you're you actually have to scan across all those characters in the inner loop. Right. I remember Ivan Drucker did a series of articles for JuiceGS about structured AppleSoft and ways to write your program in a word processor and then port it into AppleSoft. Right. You know, just now I'm thinking that maybe what you could even do is instead of using a word processor, you use a spreadsheet program like Microsoft Excel, where column one is your code and column two is your commentary on each line of code. Cool. And then when, and then when you're ready to actually move it over to the Apple II, you just export out the first column. I like that. Uh, you know, Don Knuth said that you should always do the documentation as part of the program. And it was uh, Dijkstra who said that the program is actually like the part of the iceberg that sticks up, and the documentation supporting it is the giant part you can't see. But without that, the program is meaningless. So Knuth mm-hmm. said, and the only way you can keep them together is to have them all be one thing. So he would write all the documentation, the proofs of his theorems, and everything else as part of the program, and then put the source in, uh, interspersed in his proof, and then he had a program that would actually process this composite document and produce the source. Nonetheless, I can't help but think that there are some listeners cringing when I suggest writing your basic program in Microsoft Excel. <laughs> well, it's Microsoft into Microsoft. <laughs> that's that's very true. Uh, let's see. Basic. Eamon or Amen. Mike, how do you pronounce it? I always pronounced it Eamon. Eamon? Yeah. I could be wrong, but... As long as we're consistently wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Eamon is one of my favorite basic programs. I'm sure it wasn't written in Excel, but it has been ported to other programs uh, and platforms, such as Eamon Deluxe 5.0, which I briefly mentioned in a JuiceJS article I did last year about the history of interactive fiction. I spoke with the creator, I think his name is Frank Kunz, and he is back on the scene and working on version 5.0, which I believe, Mike, you wrote about for A2 Central. Uh, I did. I posted that he has mailed the beta version out to playtesters. And in fact, I was on that list and and installed it and was playing it just last night. Are you under NDA for that? Uh, I didn't see anything in the documentation or, or what he sent along that mentioned that. So uh, I'll reread it before we post this and we can chop this out if that is in fact the case. But uh it's uh, i haven't encountered any problems with it at all it, it looks looks really complete and and hopefully he'll be releasing the final product soon and under what operating system are you running this uh this is windows 7 i, I believe this is just a a windows product so this is a windows 7 adaptation of the classic text adventure game that comes in different modules uh can you use just any old apple 2 eman adventure I haven't explored it that much yet. It, it does come with a, a set of games uh, pre-installed uh, as part of the installer. Yeah, if I recall correctly, there is some sort of a conversion routine so that there is overlap. You don't have to start all your adventures from scratch, but there is some work necessary to get the thing from the Apple II to Windows. Right, yeah. If, if you have pre-existing games, uh, I know it's not a one-step process. One of the tricky things is that so many... Eman adventures do unique things. Uh, Tom Zukowski mentioned that almost every Eman adventure he ever saw was doing something unique, and Wade Clark did several interesting things for his program Lead Light last year. But it's really cool to see advances in Eman occurring even today. I, I recall Wade said that one of the reasons that his game may have been poorly received, it wasn't poorly received, but it was middle of the line, 
at the interactive fiction competition is because folks weren't used to playing interactive fiction on an Apple II. Even with that classic genre of entertainment, they were still accustomed to a modern environment, and they found the Apple II a little bit off-putting. And he kind of proved them right when he re-entered the next year with a new game written in Inform 7 and ranked in the top five, I think. <clears throat> so being able to play an Eamon adventure in Windows 7 opens it up to a much larger audience. Still, that audience is probably more accustomed to the Inform 7 adventures that most people are making nowadays. So I hope that this isn't still too off-putting for them. Well, I wouldn't think so. I mean, this this comes as a a prepackaged uh, Windows installer program. All you got to do is double click it, and it installs, and and you're off and running. There's, it's not like you have to figure out how to get this thing from the internet onto your Apple II and boot it up and play it that way. Mm-hmm. It it should be fairly easy. It comes. Uh, there's a version of DOSBox, the the DOS emulator that's that uh, installs with this. Um, and it all happens behind the scenes, so I, I can't see that. Uh, I can't imagine that there would be a lot of complaining, but you never know. I mean, once you have it up and running, should the player even care how it was written? No, I don't think so. As long as it, it works and you're getting the experience, that's that's really what you want the end user to have. Right, Michael. Are you much of a gamer, text or otherwise? Uh, never been very much of one. No, you know, I have. I kind of a uh, back in the days of Colossal Cave. <laughs> the giant Fortran program that would run on mainframes. Uh, I I sort of found out about adventure games, but was never uh, never sucked into them. Oh, it's interesting that you created not a pong as your demonstration of not a net, and yet probably don't didn't go home and play it all that much. Uh, no, I did not. Although interestingly enough, I had a couple versions of the pong game back in the back in whatever it was, the seventies. You mean the stand up arcade games? Uh, no, the kind that you plugged into your TV. Oh, okay. Oh, like the, was it the Magnavox Odyssey or something? Uh, this actually, I had an Atari version, and then, of course, I had one of the rip-off versions, of which there were about three dozen. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember somebody came into my house recently and saw I had five video game systems hooked up, and they said, I didn't know that there were that many. <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, those are just the five that have come out in the last 10 years. You should have been here 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> I got another dozen in my parents' basement. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. There seems to be some resurgence, just like in the chiptunes arena. There seems to be a resurgence of interest in some of the old-style uh, games because they were often designed for playability as opposed to fancy graphics. And people are beginning to realize playability is actually more important than fancy graphics. Well, one of the other problems is that games today take advantage of all the resources that are available to them. So they span multiple DVDs and run at 2 gigahertz that they can put out billions of polygons per second. And that significantly raises the barrier for entry because folks have to sit down and learn what 20 different buttons on a controller do. And that's daunting. Well, it kind of reminds me of Stan Freeberg's remark back in the late 50s or early 60s when he said that on the radio, you could, without without much preparation or any special uh, special effects budget, you could drop a two-ton cherry on top of a seven-story uh, ice cream sundae in the middle of Lake Michigan. <laughs> uh-huh. I like that. And now, of course, if you want to do that, you need a green screen and Final Cut Pro. Exactly. Or Michael Bay. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think people's imaginations are really quite excellent, and that's one of the reasons that you didn't have to have Mario did not have to have uh, uh, teeth that you could count for you to be able to enjoy playing Mario. Right. All you needed was four colors. Right. And I think one of the reasons we seem to be returning to that level of gameplay is because of the mobility that our technology has taken. You know, when folks pull out their phone. They don't have the 20 buttons to play a complex game of Metal Gear Solid 4. They just want to play Angry Birds. And they don't have the 50 watts of graphics processing. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I was recently playing a new version of a game I used to play on the Apple II, Choplifter. You two remember that? I sure do. Even though you weren't a gamer, Michael? No, but I found Choplifter to be an amazing game to crack. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Really? I I didn't know you were into that. Oh yeah, well that was uh, that was one of the things. Of, the games were the only things really that had uh, hover protections, and the protections I found much more fun than the games. Now, why do you think? 
I mean, I can. I have my own answers for these, but why do you think games were better protected than other programs? Oh well, because they were so easily ripped off, and they were complete, pretty much in the in the disc itself. You didn't need much documentation. If you ripped off uh, Apple Works, uh, you really had to get a copy of Apple Works to be able to use it for much. It, the, that is the documentation. Uh, but if you ripped off Choplifter, uh, you could get all that in one page. Right. That's a good point. I hadn't thought of it that way. Well, Choplifter HD isn't actually that much more complex. It came out last month for PC, Xbox 360, and PS3. It's a downloadable uh, game for all three. A lot of people say digital download, but I'm not sure what the alternative is, an analog <laughs> download. Honestly. <laughs> new, cat new categories of redundancy. Right. I guess they're just trying to make sure people understand it's not a physical retail product. Uh -huh. uh, but anyway, I download the demo for th the Xbox 360. I didn't pay the full $15, so I only had about 10 minutes to play before the timer was up. But it was pretty cool. It's very similar to the original in that it's two-dimensional. You're flying left to right or right to left, rescuing soldiers and hostages and bringing them back to base, uh, firing at the enemies as they show up. There are a couple of uh, new complexities, like there's a fuel gauge so you can run out of gas, and you fuel up any time that you return to your base, but there are also fuel depots scattered throughout the level. And besides firing left and right, you sometimes have to fire sort of into the foreground. You're flying in front of enemies, and you need to face them if you want to shoot at them. And as you accomplish each level at different speeds or at different scores, you earn faster, stronger helicopters that have more capacity for more hostages and the like. I wouldn't mind spending the 15 bucks to buy it. My only hesitancy is that I'm actually behind on my gaming, and I have unplayed games that I've already bought, and I think I should acknowledge that investment before I go buying more. But yeah, if anybody has one of those three systems, Windows, uh, Xbox, or PS3, definitely check it out. It was advised by Dan Gorlin, who created the original Choplifter, so this recreation has his blessing. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, I've always wondered how he feels when he is drawn upon for that accomplishment because he's done a lot more in the last 30 years. He's not the same guy he was when he sat down to make that Apple II game. And I don't think it's his primary ambition anymore. So does he get frustrated and say, hey, you know, that was just one of many things I've done? Or does he say, it's really great to be remembered and to realize that I did something 30 years ago that has meant so much to so many people and to have the opportunity to bring it to a new generation of gamers? I presume it's the latter since he was involved with this project, but I'd love to sit down and ask him. Yeah, I think that is a universal problem. Uh, particularly I, uh, when you say that, I think about laws. Right. You know, so many people aren't asking him about his work at Fusion IO. He, they're asking him about the Apple II. And what is there left to be told? Uh, I suspect probably several thousand stories that no one will ever hear. <laughs> well, I hope we don't have to wait until Walter Isaacson does a posthumous biography. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Hmm. Hmm. Or maybe he can go the Mark Twain route and say, publish my biography 100 years after I die. <laughs> uh, if, if folks still remember Waz in 100 years, I think I'd be okay with that. Yeah, that's interesting. It, I think that you know, actually this is, not a, this is actually a human problem. I mean, how do you come to terms with your whole life? Right? Uh, when, when people do things early that cause, create a lot of attention and uh, produce a lot of kudos, uh, then you have to kind of deal with that for the rest of your life with you. you know, it's, it's kind of a test. That's why I'm saving my, all my greatest accomplishments until I'm in my 80s. There you go. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so we both have another good 50 years in front of us then. Right on. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to finance all those pros, those projects with the, the uh, all the money that I make on DMS Drummer. <laughs> That's right. And I need to come out with my golden goose. Then. Oh, let's see, another game, but one I'm not familiar with is Rescue Raiders. Mike, have you played this? I was a big fan of Rescue Raiders. It's a game that's sort of similar to, it's a side-scroller, and you start out at one end of the map, and, and the bad guy starts out at the other end, and you sort of send your troops at each other, and, and whoever sends out the best assortment of tanks and troops and helicopters uh, wins uh, the wins the round and you advance to the next level. So it's a multiplayer competitive game? No, it's just you versus the computer. Oh, okay. And it's set in World War II. Too soon. <laughs> you ostensibly move around to various locations in, in France and Germany. 
And why are we bringing this up? I received an email, and I think you did too, from I did. Uh, <laughs> from uh, oh boy, uh, Olivier Guinard. I, I hope I pronounced that right. I'm sure they'll correct me if I didn't. I think he previously told me that it rhymes with guitar. So I was like, Gunnar. Okay. So you want <laughs> go ahead and try that again if you want. No thanks. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he, he emailed the, that's that somebody was working on a a, um, a port of Rescue Raiders for Windows Phone Seven, and then he emailed a little bit later, in fact, just earlier today, saying that there hadn't been a whole lot of work done on this, and I, and I don't know if we want to talk about it too much, just because at this point it's really vaporware since nothing actually exists. Yeah, the developer, Jason Go emailed Olivier to say that he hasn't actually even begun development on it, although the website says the targeted release is winter 2011, which obviously has passed. Hmm. However, Jason did go on to offer a, a consolation prize, which is that years ago he wrote a web-based game called Rescue Battlefield, which is also inspired by Rescue Raiders, and that is a game that you can go ahead and play today. Hmm. So hmm. the link will be in the show notes. Uh, Olivier says he was quite impressed with the prototype and that he's looking forward to listening to the podcast. Great. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, this is the same listener, by the way, who got us listed on the Zune Marketplace. So we appreciate his support, both in providing content, getting our show heard. We love listeners like that. So thank you very much, sir. And our last game-related news item this month comes from Jimmy Mayer, whose amazing and extensive writings about the Apple II and especially the gaming history, text adventures and more, we've previously plugged on this show. He has an entire ebook out on the subject, in fact, which we recommend. He emailed me today to say that he is contemplating hosting a robot war in the tradition of computer gaming world. Do either of you remember that? No. Michael? Uh, I suspect you mean uh, uh, user-programmed robots that fight each other inside the game. Exactly. So you are familiar with it. I'm familiar with the idea of it, and uh, I don't think I ever actually made one, but I do have the software sitting around somewhere. Well, apparently Muse Software, the same company that published Wolfenstein, or rather Castle Wolfenstein by Silas Warner, released a program called Robot War. And uh, Computer Gaming World, CGW, used to host competitions in which folks would use this program and write their own, basically like a routine for their robot. And then they would send it into the arena, and it's entirely software-based, not hardware-based like the ones that Peter Neubauer or James Littlejohn have demonstrated for us at KFest. And they, they use their predefined programming to figure out how to interact with and attack the opponent's robot, and, you know, one shall stand and one shall fall. Pretty cool idea. Yeah, actually, it's, to be honest, not one I'm familiar with. I've seen... Uh, computer simulations, of course, of various organisms, everything from Peter Neubauer's Conway's Game of Life to more complicated projects that I used to advise when I was a teacher. But I've never really seen it as an sort of an automated competitive process, and that's a pretty cool idea, like you said. Jimmy has not determined definitively that he'll be hosting this competition, but he's looking for some feedback about whether or not he should. There will be a link in the show notes to his website where you can leave him some feedback. Oh, one thing he said is that you will be allowed to edit your robot between battles. He's planning on doing a screencast of each fight and uploading it to YouTube or Vimeo or somewhere so folks can actually see how the fight played out. And then the winner can use that as a sort of feedback to tweak his robot for the next round. So the robot will be evolving through input from the programmer as he progresses through the competitive ladder. Interesting. I'm not really sure what language this is done in. Robot War, the program, has what looks like its own language, but it's very human-readable. It seems similar to me to BASIC, so I don't think it should be too off-putting for folks to give it a try. I think you're right. Cool. Other throwbacks to yesteryear include the names... Dan Kotke, who, Mike, you've talked about many times on this show, and Thomas Kurtz, who is the inventor of the basic language. As it turns out, both of them will be speaking at the Vintage Computer Festival East 8.0 being held Saturday, May 5th and Sunday, May 6th in Wall Township, New Jersey. Mike, what employee number was Dan Kotke? Was he 13? I thought it was like 17 or something like that. It was definitely low. Well, he was actually employee. He was the first employee that, that got a paycheck from Apple, but 
he went off to college and then came back to Apple, and that's when they were giving numbers, and so that he got 17. Okay. Uh, I just looked it up on Wikipedia because that's the most trustworthy source there is, and he's number 12. Okay, uh, then he's number 12. Yeah, It must be true. I read it on the internet. That's right. <laughs> and Apple employee number 12 will be speaking at VCF, which is a pretty cool keynote. I hope that he doesn't just talk about Steve Jobs. You know, I, I mean... He he did he did that for the book and he did that on um that uh this week in tech show um triangulations that, that Leo Laporte does and, and that was interesting but I, I think he's done so much more interesting stuff at Apple, uh, especially from a technical standpoint. I mean well, I won't I won't be there, so I don't know, but what would you like to hear him speak about if you were there? Well, uh, for me, as an Apple III fan, I'd like to hear about his perspective on the history of what exactly went wrong with that machine because he was the tech that, that built the wire wrap boards and, and troubleshot a lot of the problems when Wendell Sander was, was doing the engineering uh, on the Apple III, and I know he did some Apple II stuff as well. Yeah, I'll be missing VCF as well. I went last year, but this year conflicts with RaffleCon, which is a biennial event held at MIT regarding Internet memes and culture. So I think I'd rather attend that, partly because it's only held every other year, and also because it's so much closer. I can drive to MIT in 30 minutes, whereas Wall Township is four hours from me. Uh, it'd be cool to hear Dan speak, but I'm, I know that Evan has done a good job of recording and publishing events like this before, such as when Chuck Peddle gave the keynote one year. So I'm hoping that at some point in the future, this event will become available to people who weren't able to be there in person. I think we mentioned on a previous show that I used to be a member of the Apple User Society of Melbourne, or AUSOM for short. Awesome. I moved last year, and I was going through the various junk that I've accumulated over the years, and I found some of the print magazines that were distributed to members of that user group. I emailed them to ask if they wanted scanned copies of them to add to their archives in case they don't have them from back then anymore. Mike, I think you volunteered your expertise at the scanning aspect of it. Sure. As it turns out, they're way ahead of us. They have every issue they've published since November of 1999 on, available for free for download on their website. You don't even have to be a member or be paying dues. If you want to buy them all on DVD, you can, because that's a lot of PDFs to download, and, and that's a good way to support the group. But if you just want to download them, they're right there. Only two issues, as far as I noticed, the ones from November and December 1999, are actual scans and therefore aren't OCR'd, but all the others appear to have been digitally produced from scratch. So these are the original PDFs, and you can download them, search them. I'm not sure how much Apple II coverage they have. 1999 is kind of late to expect a user group to support that, but I do know that there was still an Apple II SIG when I was in Melbourne in the spring of 2000, although actually it was only the spring for us North Americans. It was the fall for them. So that's a very well-documented archive of Apple's history, and it's great to see that there are other communities out there who are aware of the importance of this literature and are preserving it and making it available before it's too late. I certainly agree. Are you familiar with the Rhode Island Apple user group? I think David Kerwood is involved with that. Yeah, they're still online, and, and they still appear to be active. And if you go to their webpage, you, it looks like you can download their monthly newsletters in PDF format as well. Oh, excellent. And, yeah, and in fact, their their webpage is part of the West Bay Web Apple II web ring. Yes, West Bay Web, I think, basically is David Kerwood. Ah. I know he runs the web ring anyway, and the A2 Web, a2-web.com, used to be held at W bwip.com and and that also used to host the juice gs website along with a couple of others cool yeah the last time i was thinking about doing some sort of a story for juice gs about the evolution and uh current state of user groups it's just another thing i have on the back burner and i remember doing some preliminary research a year or two ago and came across that rhode island website and i think the footer on their website said that they meet like the second tuesday of every month or something like that but it I wasn't. I couldn't be confident that that was a recently updated website. Yeah, um, they do. They do have the January newsletter of 2012 up and available. So somebody's doing something with it. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, their their newsletter archives only go back to 2008, but there's some stuff. They do have documents that go all the way back to April of 1998. So, wow. 
again, I don't know how much Apple II stuff specifically you're going to find in there, um, but it might be worth a look. It's also probably worth me checking out personally. I was in Providence, Rhode Island just last night, actually, for their monthly WordPress meetup. And if I'm willing to travel that far for WordPress, then I can certainly go there again for the Apple II. Sure. Wow, an actual Apple II users group that meets in person. That's amazing. <laughs> Maybe we should get together like once a year in Kansas City, too. <laughs> what? That would be unheard of. Yeah, I used to, in Silicon Valley, I used to have my choice of two or three Apple user groups that met every month. Earl Evans has said that in his neck of the woods, which I think is Portland, Oregon, there are two Commodore 64 user groups. That's just, I, I don't understand why you'd want to have that much overlap. I mean, I'm sure that they're more collaborative than competitive, but still, two groups. Well, I think the active Commodore user base is still mu is much larger than, than the Apple II uh, base. And that was true even when those products were still being sold, right? Right. Yeah, well, and that's why it's bigger now is because they sold a lot more Commodore 64s than they did Apple IIs. So is it just because I have my blinders on and it seems like the Apple II community is more vibrant? Obviously, I'm on A2 Central every day. I'm not on, like, C64 Central every day. But is there as much going on with the C64 as there is the Apple II? Yeah. In fact, I think there's probably more. I mean, there's a lot of new hardware products that come out for the, the Commodore every year. And um, I don't know about their software stuff, but... Do they have podcasts? I imagine they would. That's amazing. We need to find these people. Yeah. <laughs> you have to admit you're arousing my curiosity. <laughs> no, like, we should do some sort of, like, a host swap. Like, it'll be me and this other guy, and Mike, you can go on their show with some other guy. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I mean, they did that on Star Trek The Next Generation. They swapped Riker for that Klingon. Well, if Riker did it, then I'm in. Right. I mean, you're at least as manly as he is, especially with your deep voice tonight. <laughs> Sexy. <laughs> Kapla. <laughs> yeah, it looks like there's a bunch of Commodore 64 podcasts. Amazing. I just did a Google search on it, and there's several that popped up. I wonder how many people would stop listening to us after we've spoken so fondly of them, because Apple II and Commodore 64 rivalry is still pretty strong, isn't it? Uh, I doubt it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, hey, if we can if we can make friends with Jerry Ellsworth, it can't be that bad. Yeah, yeah, I think actually it's uh, as things get older and recede into the past, the differences become more of historical interest. But uh, still, when people say, "Well, which do you, which is the better computer?" that I'm sure you'll get very partisan reactions on both sides. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I remember on Jason Scott's documentary Get Lamp, he interviewed a couple of people, and one of the questions he asked was, "Do you pronounce it sysop or sysop?" And there are still people who are passionate about their answer. Oh, yeah. It's obviously sysop because this is short for system. Right. System operator, sysop. And we don't run the, you know, these things don't run on systems. Right. So see, the three of us, we just think it's so obvious, but there are people out there who will combat us vehemently that it's sysop. We'll get angry emails about this. And that's only because they had no context for sysop. They thought it was just a combination of letters. But in mm. fact, it means system operator. And maybe even after they learned, it's just that old habits die hard. Yes. Well, when I when I was a kid, I thought it was Island, and it was only later when I heard people say it, I realized it was Island. Ah. Hmm. Yeah, I just met a gentleman in his eighties <clears throat> who has been saying the word "missled," and I had to correct him and say it, it's actually misled. <laughs> wow. It's like oh. <laughs> and you're never too old to learn. Love it. <laughs> So, Mike, tell me about Bob Cook of Sun Remarketing. Uh, well, David Grealish made some made uh, tech news headlines recently when he interviewed John Scully, and he also interviewed Bob Cook of Sun Remarketing, which uh, I'm sure will be a familiar name to Apple II users um, and early Mac and Lisa users as well. Uh, it's a 45 minute interview, and it's it's very interesting. He goes into the history of how he got into selling the Apple III machines and, and the Lisa machines. Um, and how Apple, you know, came into his warehouse and, and took his leases and buried them uh, in that that Utah landfill. Uh, so it's definitely worth a listen if you're if you're into that uh, aspect of Apple II history. Wow, I'm glad they didn't bury his Apple IIe's. No, it was just the leases. And, and according to to Bob, I guess they they did it because they they got some sort of tax write off for it. But the cost for them to bury it, I, I guess, far outweighed any tax benefit that they would have received for doing that. Right. You know, they they actually had the biggest stash of, uh, of Apple 3.5 cards. Hmm, didn't know that. 
Yeah, they began to slowly come out about, what, five, six years ago? And, yeah. And you could actually order them by the dozen from their website for like 20 bucks a piece. Yep, and now they're on eBay for 400 bucks. You know, in sort of a meta interview, we interviewed David Grealish last month about his interview with John Scully. The episode before that we did was the end of year roundtable in which I asked folks for their favorite hardware and I inquired, why haven't more people done things that are amazing with the carte blanche card? Because it's been out for a couple of years since Alex Freed released it and I haven't heard many people do much with this be anything you want card but it sounds like somebody has finally done something with it a guy named charlie and i'm not seeing his last name on his web page here posted to compsys apple 2 uh, that he had come up with a 12-bit color output modification for the card blanche card and bill garber i guess has made a handful of them so if you have one of these cards you can order it from him and he said it's just a cable with some resistors and a bit stream to send video to the ide connector instead of the onboard 6-bit video connector you don't actually have to alter the carte blanche itself, and the new bitstream now allows full color 4096 um, and handles pouts correctly and works in both 640 and 320 SHR modes. So if you have one of these, it's probably a pretty interesting uh, modification. Yeah, I think the real trick was handling those other display modes. Yeah, well, that's that's always kind of been the, the catch for VGA out from the 2GS, right? Right. The, the, originally, the carte blanche just handled the, the standard 8-bit uh, modes. And I think, by the way, it's really good to see something new come out for the carte blanche, but it really has a very high barrier to entry. You have to you have to spend some time studying some books before you can do anything with this carte blanche. So, do you have one of these cards, Michael? Yes, I do. And what's your opinion of the carte blanche? Well, I think it's a great card, very well constructed, uh, nicely laid out, uh, something that has a lot of versatility. And the unfortunate thing is that the versatility requires you to be a hardware designer to use it. Yeah, I had originally signed up to buy one of these um, when they were announced, and it sort of occurred to me that this is a card where, because I'm not a hardware engineer, I don't design this sort of thing where I would have to buy this card and then wait for somebody else to, to do something with it for it to be of, of much use to, to me as an end user. Yeah, I think a number of people came to that conclusion. But it's nice to see that, that it's not sitting completely idle. Well, uh, making something that provides a VGA output for the 2GS is a major contribution. Of course, they're not making carte blanches anymore, so if you don't have one, you're kind of out of luck. Maybe there'll be a little churn in the used carte blanche market. <laughs> Maybe so. They're not making these anymore? Uh, no, there was like, I think they made 50 cards or something like that, and that's that was it. That's a shame. Well, they're kind of expensive to produce. Yeah, it's true. They had a, it's not a high-end FPGA, but it is an FPGA on the card. Right. Now, speaking of VGA, I was recently sent a video of an Apple II color demodulator, but like Mike, I'm not really a hardware person. I'm not sure what this is. Michael, have you seen this video? No, I haven't. You can go to YouTube and search on Apple color demodulator. Color is spelled British with a U. Oh, color. Yes. And, the, and there are actually two videos on there. The first one is longer but i was referring to the second one. Oh, actually this first video that i haven't seen before has a little bit more explanation it says i'm working on a circuit that can demodulate the ntsc output of an apple 2c to a yuv component signal i'm using mc1496 modulator demodulators still not sure i understand that so it is is com it's composite video which is split out to um component video is that right oh, okay and component that's the Red, green, blue. It's the the red and luminance difference, and the and the blue and luminance difference and luminance. So it's uh, it's the usually called YCRCB. Yeah. So isn't that red, green, blue? No. No, it's, it's... <laughs> no, it's matrixed. If you add those, mm -hmm. if you do the right additions and subtractions of those signals, you can get red, green, and blue out of it. Uh, but it turns out that the luminance signal, which is predominantly green, uh, actually is sent with much higher resolution than the two chrominance signals, because you know you it's it turns out your eye is very sensitive to luminance luminance resolution, but not very sensitive to color resolution. So for an end user, this this would be something you could plug into your two C, and then you could plug it direct, directly into the the um, component video plugs in the back of your television and get a nice crisp picture. That's a great idea. And this has not been previously possible? Uh, 
No. <laughs> it, well, there are there are some boxes out there that will take RGB and matrix matrix it into YCRCB, but uh, they have not been very popular. Uh, that always seemed like the natural way to handle things like the 2GS, because it's a little box you can do with like four video op amps. You don't have any RAMs, no processing, no nothing, just all simple analog processing. And then you could plug it into a modern TV. But for some reason, oh, I see, it's now talking to me, uh -huh. even though I'm muted. <laughs> Apparently that doesn't mute the sound on YouTube. Oh, well, seems like it works pretty well. <laughs> so that's what we were looking at. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, this is a, so what he's talking about here are, let's see, how is he doing it? Oh, that's interesting. What's that? So he's actually starting off with the, with the composite output, uh, which is not an RGB signal, and then using that to convert to YUV, which is harder to do. Uh, if you were coming out with an RGB adapter like you would have with the 2GS, it's pretty easy. So that's cool. And he says that this should work with an NTSC unit, but he's actually in Australia, so he's working on the PAL standard. Right. Well, there, aside from a small change in the color reference frequency, uh, I wouldn't think there'd be any difference because this also is mostly analog processing. You don't have to be synchronized with a line or anything like that. I just found his website, which is kaput.retroarchive.org slash apple2. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And, and hat tip to Blake Patterson, who tweeted us this link in the first place. Thanks, Blake. Yeah. Although maybe we should just refer to him as Blake without his last name, because he loves when the retro community just knows who he is, and he doesn't need to be any further identified than by simply Blake. Yeah, but he's a hater. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of haters... <laughs> We have somebody who entered or tried to enter the retro challenge that we talked about last month, the winter warm-up. Hater? Hey, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, tell us about your project in the retro challenge winter warm-up. Well, I was going to do something on the Apple III and use Pascal. I used this as an opportunity to improve my Pascal skills. I ran into a couple of issues. One was just simply time. Um, I kind of entered and turned around and two weeks had passed and there were only two weeks left. Um, and I still hadn't really come up with an idea of what I wanted to do. And the guy that runs the thing tweeted me and or he tweeted that, that, you know, Hey, look, this guy just hasn't even decided yet. And I'm like, you know, I'm probably just going to go ahead and hang it up. Um, and then as it turns out, the profile hard drive that I have attached to my Apple three, the, the directory structure is corrupt anyway. So I couldn't load Pascal and I have to rebuild that. So I'm going to go ahead and re-enter the summer. Uh, version of the retro challenge, I think. Well, I'm glad that you haven't given up on it. No, no, just delayed it for a little bit. Yeah, I saw your name listed on the official contestant list, Computus, working on Apple III programming project. Yep. And it, it looks like the contest is now closed. Yeah, it ran through the end of January. Which means that they're probably still evaluating the entries? I would assume so. Yeah, it looks like there are several Apple II and even Apple I projects on here, both original and replicas. Well, I think um, Egan Ford is, is listed on there, and, and it looks like his game server was his project. Yeah, I think you're right. I think Egan is listed here under the name Data Jerk. Right, that's what he goes by. Yeah. Says he's working on Apple II Plus and 2E9600 BPS cassette interface downloader. And if you click on his name, which is a link, it opens up Apple Game Server Online. Right. And if I click on your name, it goes to 6502 Lane, where you're blogging about Infocom. I am. You know what you're not doing? What's that? Winning the retro challenge. <sighs> What's it worth to you? Hold on to your wallet as we look at the latest Apple pickings. Coming at you this month is the shortest eBay section ever on Open Apple, at least since our first episode launched a year ago this month. And I'm going to open with the Ultima 4. Uh, we've had several Ultimas on this show before, not as guests, but as eBay items. Uh, we're all big fans of RPGs here. Uh, well, maybe not you, Michael. <laughs> this is a super ultra rare copy of Ultima 4, as are all of them on eBay. It's for the Apple II, and the description says it comes with the original game box, the manuals, the maps, the Ankh, and a working, key point, working, five and a quarter inch diskette. Box is in good condition with only a minor wrinkle, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the current bid, there have been two bids so far. 
and stands at $25, which in my opinion is a steal. And it closes on February 7th. Wow. The seller doesn't have a huge rating, but it is all positive, and he's shipping from Richmond Hill, Ontario, Canada. So if you're one of the two Canadians in the Apple II community, you can probably get a good deal on shipping. That's pretty remarkable. Now, of course, it only has two bids on it. I guess it's hard to know what people actually think it's worth. Yeah, I'm wondering if other folks are watching the auction and waiting to the last minute, or if this just isn't generating a lot of interest for some reason. If I were bidding on it, I would wait till the last minute. Maybe you are bidding on it. <laughs> No, but but I am a habitual sniper. Ah, so you're the one. Always. If you're not in the United States, I should mention that shipping is a whopping $28.77, which is more than the current bid on this item. That may actually be within Canada as well. I'm not quite sure I understand the listing here. But that's a lot of shipping. Sure is. So even if it's currently going for a reasonable rate, the current bidder is still looking at spending over $50. Uh, for a game that's not new in box. But, you know, sometimes you can't put a price on a uh, return to Britannia. Ultima 4 may be retro, but there's also some newer stuff showing up on eBay as well. The CFFA. That auction finished today, I think, or yesterday. It's interesting. It sold for $307, which is about double what you would pay if you bought it from Rich. So I guess if you didn't want, I guess whoever was buying this didn't want to wait for the second run of cards. But, you know, if you got to have it now, there's always eBay. Well, the next run of cards might not be for another half a year. That's true. Yeah. And the, the seller, it, he says he bought two of them and decided that he was only going to use one of them, which is just madness, but he did make a, a good profit on it. Is it madness that he bought two or that he's using only one? No, that he decided he wasn't going to use a second one. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, really. How many do you need, Mike? Five or six. Each one of my active apples. Oh, my. Yeah. And, Michael, you have one too, right? Uh, actually, I have a couple of them. And uh, ah. and I have and those are for my two active apples and then I've got the older CFFAs for a couple others. Now would would you sell one of your CFFA three thousands on eBay? No, I don't think I would. <laughs> would you sell it to me? Well, we'll, we'll have to talk <laughs> <laughs> for three hundred and ten bucks. <laughs> yeah, did you miss out, Ken? I did. I had what seemed at the time a good reason to not buy one, even though I wanted one. I, I wanted one eventually, just not when I was sitting five feet away from them at K-Fest. And, of course, they sold out. And, of course, he's not making any more for a long time. So, of course, I'm without one. Of course. Oh, well. I'll just have to hope that he makes more. I think that in, in past, usually when he gets up to the point where he's got commitments for a break-even quantity, he goes ahead and makes a new run. Well, and considering how fast this run of cards sold out, I, I imagine he's already got that number and then some. That's what I'm thinking. But since he's not taking pre-orders, it's hard to know how many of those people will actually come through. I mean, I told him I was interested in the first run, and look what a liar I turned out to be. That's true. Uh, well, I, I I think he shipped all the first cards. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those did not last long. No. Nope. Yeah, they're beautifully made cards. Full of awesome and lin. I have a question about the item description. It says, CFFA 3000 1.0 Revision C. Have there been other revisions that have actually shipped? I think those were the, the test boards that he sent out to to a few people, the, the A and B, like David Schmidt and people like that. He's So he's not referring to, for example, the previous two versions of the CFFA, like the original, the version 2.0, and now the 3000? No. That, no. Okay, I didn't, I didn't think so. just wanted to clarify. Yeah, I think the firmware turned around a couple times. And as I recall from the JuiceGS review you wrote, Mike, those are pretty easy to update, right? You load the files onto onto the card and, and power the Apple up, and, and it sees that, oh, there's an update, and it'll update it automatically for you. Nice. Yep, that's very easy. As opposed to, like, the iDisk, which required a JTAG programmer and, and a bunch of work. Right. So if you're going to be selling a CFFA 3000 on eBay, it's trivial to make sure it's the latest version oh yeah good i'm glad this guy went through that trivial effort well the, the revision c is the board revision uh, i don't think that refers to the firmware because if you look at the photo it actually says revision c on the board ah. oh i see so how can you know what firmware version there is uh the, if you go into the menu system on the cffa 3000 there's an option that'll that'll give you the information on the firmware and the uh, uh cpld and it doesn't say in the item description on eBay which version he's selling. No, but it's easy to, to update to the latest if it's not. Right. And if you need an Apple II to put that CFFA into, 
Those are available on eBay as well. That's right. A few months back, original Apple II machines were all the rage on eBay, going for thousands of dollars, and you can still pick them up for a few hundred bucks, which if you have that kind of money to spend, I guess that's a good thing. But lately, it seems these, these Platinum IIEs in the original boxes are showing up. Um, some are open and some are not, but right now there are two of them listed from the same seller, and if you bid on that, you can expect to spend a couple of hundred bucks. Looks like one of them is up to $404, and the other one is at $530. So for some reason, those are going up in price too. One thing I like about these losses is that they are not just the CPU or just the mod or anything like that. It's a complete package, and you can you get everything you need to immediately sit down, set up, and start enjoying your new acquisition. It is, yeah, and I, I think that's certainly worth something. I don't know if it's worth $530, but it's it's worth more than having to piece this thing together yourself and then go out and buy software or, or try to load something up with uh, ADT Pro or anything like that. Right, because I follow various vintage computer forums, threads, groups, whatever, and it's every now and then there is somebody posting saying, I just got an Apple II. It's my first one since childhood. It's my first one ever. What do I do next? Right. You know, and and there are multiple answers to that. You can go on eBay and buy some games. You can download ADT Pro. You can you know download a variety of freeware from Shippyware or anywhere like that. But if you already have the disc in hand, you don't even need to ask the question. Just pop it in and off you go. Yep. It's worth noting here that these two particular two E's that we're talking about uh, are shipping from Bulgaria. So I imagine that's probably a pretty expensive shipping cost to get all of that stuff over. If you're not, if you're, if you're in the U.S. or Canada or something like that. It's interesting. I think I see something here. It says free standard shipping from outside the U.S. Hmm. Yeah. If you scroll down to the shipping and handling, you can choose what country you are having it sent to to get an estimate. And to the United States, it is free. Wow. Because it's a 62 pounds of shipping. Yeah, really. Three boxes. Well, that's a pretty good deal. It certainly is. A good deal on the shipping, or does it make the whole package a good deal? On the shipping, I, like I said, I, I would, this is up above my price range right now. But you know, I guess, like you said, if if you wanted to make sure you had a complete working system, this is a way to do it. And there are at least twelve pictures of each lot, so you can get a pretty good look at exactly what it is you're getting. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'd still feel like this is mostly a collector situation. I don't know why else you'd want something in a box. Well, for the boxes, yeah, absolutely. I wonder what the story is behind this computer. How? long it's been sitting around, how it made its way to Bulgaria. Was it sold there? Was it brought there? You know, if computers could talk. Uh, I'm looking at the power supply on it. It's the, the 115 volt. You know, it's got the U.S. plug, so I don't, I doubt it was sold there. It looks exactly like the boxes you could get from Sunry Marketing. Right. Maybe that's where it came from. Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. It says that this is, uh, the comments here... So this computer is not almost new or like new. It is brand new and never been used before. Yeah, and he does specify if you live in Europe, the shipping is free. If you live in the USA, the shipping is free. Anywhere else in the world, free. <laughs> well, I'm glad he broke it down like that. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering. That's right. This guy's actually the Boot Zero guy. He's selling a bunch of the HDDD A2 cards, uh, which is the... the floppy disk replacement system for your Apple II. So I haven't bought one of those from him before, but that's who this is. Valerie AB is the people who yeah. make the Boot Zero card? Yep. Oh. Well, hey, how about that? How about that? Cool. And in fact, he has a bunch of them that you can buy on eBay right now. He doesn't say Boot Zero. It, search for HDDD A2. Items available, 10 or more. I guess that's how they're selling the, these HDDDs now. So and it looks like $60 or so. Wait, sixty dollars for one of them? For one of them, yeah. And I'm sorry, did you say you have to buy ten? No, he said in the uh, number available, it says ten or more. Oh, I see. Yeah, so yeah. he's got plenty of these. And if you go over to the Boot Zero forums, there are posts from this guy saying uh, the next round of cards is up on eBay. Michael, are you much of an eBayer? You mentioned earlier that you snipe a lot. Uh, I used to be a big eBayer. I find that uh, over the last few years, I've kind of tapered off. <laughs> is that because you're not finding anything interesting buying or you just finally ran out of funds uh no i got to the place where first off i was seeing less and less stuff at what i thought were really good prices you know those two things together make it a little less interesting than when everything is uh, uh remarkable at a fire sale 
I'm not quite sure. I have, to tell you the truth, I have not delved into eBay much in the last few months, so I don't know what is the variety of things available. Uh, the other thing I noticed was that I could easily kill an hour and a half looking over the Apple II items. Yep. I don't think this podcast is long enough, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just talk about every single Apple II item. <laughs> well, it's it, it was a... Uh, I just noticed it was a time sink for me because there was always the suspense of wanting to see what was on the next page. So it was kind of hard to quit early. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, 90% of it was not of much interest. And, and finding that 10% was really kind of cool. Uh, it's so as usual, intermittent reinforcement is the most effective kind. So every once in a while, I would see something amazing. And, and sometimes I would find the seller didn't even know what they were selling. If it figured, if I also figured out that they hadn't described it well enough so anyone else would know what they were selling, then that was almost bound to be a good deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember a couple of months ago on this show, we found a lot of cards that were, some of them weren't even identified. The guy just said, I have a box full of Apple II peripheral cards, don't know what they are, not piecing them out, take the whole lot. And I recall the price that was reasonable because he didn't know what he was selling. Right. Now, of course, there's always a chance you'll wind up with a whole bunch of broken Disc 2 controllers. <laughs> uh, that, that is to say, Disc 2 controllers with the cables ripped off. Right? That's a very common thing. But uh, the, the, you know, the new style uh, with the deconnector. However, uh, if it was from a, if the box came from a school, then the odds are it would be pretty vanilla stuff. Uh, if it came from a teacher, then there might be some really neat stuff in there. Right, and you only need one gem in there to make it worth your while. That's true. Yeah, I actually found a system once, an Apple II, be, a 2 Plus, being sold for something like $15. Uh, and he said uh, uh, something about not sure it powers up, uh, you know, just get trying to get rid of it, basically. But he had about three shots of it going around the back. And from the back shot, I could see connectors that indicated to me that there was a digital oscilloscope card in there. Wow. <laughs> So, so you picked that up? I nailed it. <laughs> nice. Uh, he didn't know what he was missing. That's no. right. It turned out to have come from a guy who was at Tektronix, who had been investigating the whether or not these little digital oscilloscope cards for Apple IIs were going to compete with Tektronix's core oscilloscope business. Kind of an interesting idea. Oh, wow. His conclusion was that there probably wasn't any competition for the high end, of course, but uh, that for schools, there might be competition. It's always interesting to, especially like with the Apple III stuff, because because it wasn't as common and not as many people know what it is. You see these Apple III's that are listed and there are cards in there and they're not described at all as to what they are. Uh, so sometimes you can pick up a really good deal that way. Yes, you can. Hey, I, kn I know what that card is. I have to have that. <laughs> Do either of you ever feel morally obligated to tell the buyer what it is they have or tell the seller what it is they have? I've tried that once or twice, and I've never received a response, so I just kind of said, well, if they don't know, it's sort of up to them to... If they don't know what they're selling, then I don't really have a lot of sympathy that they didn't make the money that they could. Yeah, I actually feel a little the same way. I've also tried... I generally do feel it's important to correct a listing if it's really misleading. Uh, right. And usually, of course, if it's misleading on purpose, then that, that correction doesn't go anywhere. But if the guy really didn't know what it was, then sometimes that helps. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I've had two instances where the person didn't know what they were selling. I've already talked about one where the person was selling a really clean 8-bit Nintendo. And once I got it home and saw what the great condition was and what the games were, I, I felt obligated to make things right and give her what I think it was worth. But there was another time when somebody was selling a PlayStation 1. This is back when it was new with like a dozen games. And he knew he had a dozen games and they weren't all that great, but still... He was only asking 250 bucks for it, which at that time was a steal. So I told him, I might want to buy that off you because this was an in-person transaction from somebody I personally knew. Let me get back to you tomorrow. I went online to like rec.games.forsale and said, I have a PlayStation 1 for sale for 400 bucks. Anybody want it? And I got to take her right away. So I went back the next day and said, yeah, I'll buy your PlayStation for 250 <laughs> Took it from him, shipped it to the guy on Usenet for 400 bucks. A week later, the guy from Usenet emails me and says, thanks for the PlayStation 1. It came in the mail just great. I brought it to the flea market, sold it piecemeal for 600 <laughs> So I guess we all benefited. And I put my money toward Nintendo 64, so uh -huh. I got what I wanted. Uh, yes, arbitrage. <laughs> this is the end of the show. 
Well, Michael, I hope you, you've had a good time joining us on Open Apple. I certainly have. It's been great to have you. I have always enjoyed your presence at Kansas Fest, and I look forward to seeing you there again. In the meantime, you're going to be representing the Apple II well up in the Pacific Northwest. That's the plan. Do you have any projects that you want to share with our readers? Any news you want to break? Our listeners, too? Well, actually, I'm. <laughs> the only break is that I'm taking a little break from programming. Uh, <gasps> I've actually... Oh, no. Uh, uh, well, you know, you, after you complete a project, you have to sit back and, and uh, rest a little bit uh, and uh, give, give time for some other seeds to sprout. Any idea what that next one might be? Mm, well, uh, I've actually got a couple of follow-on things to... Uh, that I've been thinking about for DMS Drummer, such as a, a little voice mixing program that would allow you to uh, build new voices and replace some of the voices that are built into it. So we've not seen the end of your collaboration with 8-Bit Weapon? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Excellent. Michael, is your work featured on 8-Bit Weapon's new CD, Bits with Byte? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. And is that your original DMS software, or is it a DMS Drummer as well? Um, I believe it's primarily the original software, uh, but it does have DMS Drummer, has both. So it has both oh, the cool. synthesizer and the drummer. And uh, his the, the trial cut he was showing actually has the 2C boot sounds at the beginning. Yeah, because there is a track on that CD called Apple Core 2, which I believe was made entirely with the Apple II. Usually they use the Apple II as one of their instruments, but I think Apple Core 2 was wholly Apple II. That's correct. Hence the, hence the name. Including the boot noises. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I might, this is indefinite, but I might finally get a chance to meet Seth and Michelle and see them perform live next month at the Game Fest, which is the opening weekend of the Art of the Video Game exhibit at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Exactly. That is March 16th that the exhibit opens, and they'll have Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari, and Chuck E. Cheese speaking on Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday, there's a variety of activities and exhibits inclu and performances, including by 8-Bit Weapon. In fact, he's done cool. some original compositions for that. Yes, one of which is featured on Bits with Byte. I think that's called the Art of Video Games Anthem. There you go. And Apple Core is also one of those. Oh, created specifically for the exhibit? Uh, that's correct. Oh, wow, I did not know that. Very cool. Well, in the meantime... Uh, I, it looks like it's time to say goodbye on another episode of Open Apple. Thank you to all our listeners for making it a great first year of our show and to all our guests who have provided us with hours of entertainment. It's been great fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Well, thank you, Michael. We'll speak to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Michael. All right. Good night, everybody. This has been the Open Apple Podcast. Find more episodes, read our blog, or send feedback by visiting us on the web at www.open-apple.net. This is an outrage. I'm walking off this show. I've heard that before. No, I know. <laughs> Idle threat. <laughs> One day I'll do it. You'll see. Yeah, right. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> what, me leaving the show? Thanks. No, just if you actually did it. I'm like, Mike, you're kidding, right? <laughs> Mike? You'd have to do sound effects of footsteps receding. The right, and the, the door slamming.